It was November 1954. The place was an elementary school, and it was called the Airport Elementary. Because less than 10 years before, it had been a training facility for air cadets in Sykeston, Missouri. And after the war, rather than demolish the buildings, and there were several large buildings, and they were built in the way that the military does it, with high 10-foot ceilings and, and big airy rooms and, and uh, drafty and cold. <laughs> they made it into an elementary school, and they deeded over the property to the city of Sykeston, Missouri. But in November of 1954, there was a little third grade class that was meeting in one of the rooms. And the teacher at that time had a lot of freedom. She told her class in November of 1954, children, this is what's going to happen because Christmas is coming up in just a few short weeks. We're going to memorize some scripture. And in a way, that struck fear into the heart of a little seven-year-old boy who was not even eight years old yet in the third grade. You see, he was the youngest in his class because his birthday came on Christmas Day. And in the state of Missouri at that time, if you were of age, you could go to school if your birthday came before January the 1st. So I was the youngest in my class, seven years old. Most typical third graders are eight years old. But that godly woman said, we're going to memorize some scripture. And this is the scripture that she assigned us on that particular day. She says, we're going to memorize Luke chapter 2. And start with verse 8, and we're going to memorize all the way up to verse 14. Oh, Lord, how could my little seven-year-old brain contain all of that? And we're going to do it in the Lord's version. <laughs> Think about it. It was only 1954. That radical new version, the revised standard version, had not come upon the scene yet. Well, it may be the year before it had come into churches, but only the liberals used it. Jesus and his disciples used the King James. We all know that. <laughs> and there were in that same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And Malcolm, I'm trying to bring that up in the King James and, and my phone. Oh, there it is. And there were in that same country. You see, it didn't take. For a few years, I knew it. But I've slept once or twice since those days, and my memory is fading a little bit. But those shepherds were abiding in their field, and they were keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. That's really afraid, when it makes you sore. They were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people okay what was the great joy what was the big message for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord and this shall be a sign unto you that you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger well I didn't know what swaddling clothes were and didn't know what a manger was and found out later it was the feed trough for the animals so that would be a rather strange thing. And the baby was wrapped in swaddling clothes, just a bunch of rags, best they could afford. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. 
And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has been the Lord hath made known to us. That stuck with me through the years. That was a great momentous occasion. But let me read it to you from the modern liberal translation. And this is ultra liberal. This is the New Living Translation. Way far removed from what Jesus read. Let's start with verse 1, chapter 2 of Luke. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, sore afraid, <laughs> sore afraid. Don't forget that. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Now, in 1954, in November, that was a glorious thing to hear those words because the Korean War had just, well, it had ended rather clumsily with a treaty, with a truce, which many thought was not enough. But a few years, less than 10 years before, the, the ultimate great war, Truly a world war had ended in a horrific way with the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima first and then on Nagasaki and it brought the Japanese people to their knees for unconditional surrender. <coughs> so in 1954 there was a relatively peace going on. The people were sort of breathing again saying, well, no more war. No more war. But it was less than 10 years from that time that we would be engaged in another 10-year struggle called Vietnam. Peace on earth. Peace. I've been assigned to speak on the peace that Jesus brings during the Advent season. And it says that when Jesus came, he would bring peace on earth. But... Is it possible? Is it too much to ask for? Is it beyond all reasonable expectation that we on planet Earth will somehow, someday live in peace? That's what the angels sang. That was the hope that they brought. That's what the shepherds needed to hear. And ever since our, the, there was a reality check, however, for our nation, once again, and this time it was within our boundaries. Oh, yes, there had been Pearl Harbor, and technically that was within our boundaries because that was belonging to the United States. But yet, right in New York City, in September the 11th, 2001, the enemy attacked, and we had a reality check. And that was the beginning 
of what we know as terrorism. We learned a lot of new words since then. Terrorism, uh, the, 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 the terrorist, uh, the, all sorts of different things. The, 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 and a terrorist cell, terrorist groups, Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda, uh, ISIS, uh, all sorts of new terms we've learned in the years since 2001, since the world seemed to fall apart again. Oh, we made a lot of vows after that happened. You remember it on 2001. I remember it was a Tuesday. I remember things were normal, and then by that evening it was horrible. Oh, all over, people were, were quoting uh, Second Chronicles uh, chapter 7, verse 14. Oh, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and, and restore their land, bring peace to their land. Every pulpit began to, to sound and resound with that scripture. Oh, Lord, we've sinned. You've, you've brought a reality check to us. We, we will repent. We will do this. We will do that. Oh, and it lasted for a while. People were brought to their knees. People were making vows of coming back to God. But then time went by. And things went back to normal. Well, sort of. Because after that first terror attack, there were others here there around the world yes but what what was the news the other day that that 360 some times this year we've experienced the terrorism and just this week the terror plot in california peace on earth or terror on earth what is it lord can there be peace on earth is it possible Songs promise peace on earth. Our hearts crave peace on earth. True and deep and lasting peace. But peace seems to be elusive. In 1864, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow penned a poem about peace. It expressed both his longings and, his, and the feelings of many Americans who were weary of this long and bloody battle of the Civil War. And Longfellow wrote, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. That was the promise of the angels, that when Jesus came, he, he was, had arrived, and there would be peace on earth. And that's what Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was writing about. That was the promise. But then Longfellow turned sorrowful, and he wrote more verses. He wrote, and in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Hate? Mockery? What about the peace on earth, Henry? What did he mean? You don't find these next verses in the hymnal, but Longfellow thinking about the Civil War and about the causes for which it was being fought. Oh, there were, there were those that, that said it was about state rights. There were those that said they were against dissolving the Union. There, was, there were those that, that were voting to free the slaves. There were those that were fighting to, to, to keep a, a way of, of an economy that would collapse without the forced labor. There were many different reasons for brother killing brother. But yet, where was the peace on earth? That was in Longfellow's day. He, he went on to write a couple more. And, and his own son, perhaps he was thinking of his own son who had recently been seriously wounded in the Civil War and would probably not make it another few weeks. So he wrote, Then from each loud accursed mouth the cannon thundered in the south, and with the sound the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. It was as fan earthquake rent the hearthstones of a continent and made forlorn the households born of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. He was at his deepest. 
He was at his most sorrowful. He was at his most hopeless. He was hoping. He was longing for the the song of Christmas of peace on earth. But in his mind, in those verses, he could not see that. But had he lived in our modern day, how much more awful would Longfellow have been? How could he know the, the things that we face? We live in the atomic age when one blast can annihilate thousands and thousands of people. When people have devised all sorts of new modern weapons to destroy and to defend themselves against others with modern weapons of destruction. How could Longfellow have known in 1864 the earthquake of conflict that's torn up homes, that have corrupted entire cities, that have destroyed lives all around the world, not just in military might, but but in the assault of Satan upon us? Oh, we would like to think and we would like to applaud those in in our society, those uh, sociologists who say uh, the, the goodness of humanity is within us. And things are going to get better. But as we read the scriptures, what's it going to be like as time passes? Jesus didn't give us a whole lot of opportunity for good things that were to come. He said it's going to get harder. In these future days, in these last days, people will become lovers of self. They'll be hateful. They'll be mocking people. There will be indescribable things happen. And we see that in our world today. Peace on earth. How can we imagine that? All we see are people, terrorists, but others, just a common criminal without a conscience, involved in insane, brutal Things, dictators who use the technology of today to kill and destroy any who stand in the way of their fanatical agendas. Peace on earth or terror? Open your minds to me this morning as we delve into this thing called peace. Were the angels mistaken? He said, uh, Jesus has come. Now, now they're going, peace on earth. Think with me about the foolish ways that we try to achieve peace in our lives. And and that will set the stage for us to praise God for Jesus Christ. The authentic hope of of precious peace and genuine peace. First of all, let's look at the worlds. Let's compare the two worlds at the time of Jesus' birth and in our modern times. In the time of Jesus, it was a time when some some people trusted in the government for everything. (laughs) <laughs> it was a time when much like ours, when some people, particularly those in positions of power, really thought Rome could do it all. Oh, we, we can do it all, but look at the might of Rome, and, and they're in charge. They, they'll protect. They, they, will, they know what's going on. They do it all. And if Rome didn't do it, it couldn't be done. Just as in our own day, we have some folks who are quick to expect the president, the congress, the mayors, the, bu- the bureaucrats to do everything under the sun to protect us, to make life better for us, to enrich our lives. We have a strong military. Will it protect us? Oh, Rome had an extensive system of control. Its military might was felt far from the capital city. Its governors were like the CIA watching over every little twitch of political opinion. It was a time when some trusted in the government for everything. But there was no peace. Those angels needed, uh, those, those shepherds, the people of that time needed that message that he has arrived, there will be peace. Yet there was no peace. No peace because you understand nothing but power, and then power battles power. If you understand nothing but military might, then military might fights military might. And does that bring peace? Maybe there will be a time of uneasy quiet for a few years, but not peace. The attack on the Pentagon reminded us how the government-dependent peace could be shattered. Our very, the very center of our military might was attacked. Where was the government then? It was a time when people thought the government could take care of things. 
In the time of Jesus, that was a time when, when some people trusted in, in their wealth to make themselves invulnerable. It was a time much like ours when accumulating wealth had become an obsession for many people. And if you're tuning me off right now saying, well, I can, I can just stop up my ears and, and sleep for a few moments because I'm not wealthy. Don't kid yourself. We are the one percenters of the world. We are the one percenters of the world. Even the poorest among us in this congregation and throughout Dallas have so much compared to the rest of the world. When you go into a country and you go, and many of you, I'm not telling you something you don't already know. You've been there. You've seen that, that a person's possession is, is, is one shirt, one pair of pants, maybe a pair of shoes. And maybe if they're lucky, they have one light bulb dangling from their little uh, place of abode. And they're wealthy. They're rich. I remember when I traveled to... Uh, Ecuador and Peru a few years ago. I, I took some pictures of, of my home and, and I lived in a, a little uh, home that's about a thousand square feet, little ranch style out in the uh, prairies of Ulysses, Kansas and, and uh, not a whole lot of scenery. I didn't exactly get yard of the month, I'll tell you that. You know, I might have got, uh, uh, what was a tumbleweed of the month. When, when we moved to Kansas and we were on our way there, Christy and her older sister were just amazed at the tumbleweeds. As they rolled across the prairie. And I'd hit one with the car. You got another one, Daddy? You hunted that one. Sometimes you would hunt tumbleweeds as they, you'd run over them. They seemed to multiply. But I took a picture of my house and, and I had, I usually had one car that, yeah, you could maybe say it was a good car. And then I always had an old junker. So I, you know, I don't know why it possessed me to take pictures of these, but I took them with me. And, and some of the, the individuals I was uh, meeting in, in Peru and Ecuador, I'd show them my, my pictures. And they'd go, oh, ooh, su casa? Your house? Oh, grande, grande. Well, I hadn't thought of it like that. Boy, I lived in a grande house, didn't we, Christy? And then, oh, su auto? Your car? Door Sautas? <laughs> One of them was no 66 El Camino. I think it used to belong to a drug dealer because of all the characters that would jump out in the streets. You know, when I drive down Main Street, they'd jump out and try to wave me into the alley, you know. So I always had wondered about the history of that old, old El Camino. <laughs> but Dos Autos? Whoa. I mean, this was a kind of old car that the girls would hide and pretend that I wasn't their daddy when I'd pull up in front of the front of the school, you know, to pick them up, you know, they were really embarrassed. But hey, you gotta do what you gotta do, you know? And uh but we trust in our wealth. We really do. We we get complacent. I, I don't remember the last time that, that I had to to uh beg for food. I don't remember the last time that, that we had to I'll be really concerned about what we'd buy at the grocery store. Oh, there have been some slim times. Yeah, yeah, you know, all of us. But but not really. Can you remember a time when your, when your stomach was just totally empty and, and then another day, another day, another day might go by and still nothing? I don't think so. We have so much. We've had so much. We are blessed so much in the things that, that uh, m many people in the world suffer because they don't have. Uh, the, the people of Jesus' day, some of them had uh, wealth and accumulating wealth had become an obsession for some of them. They had built their fine homes. They constructed great palaces for their institutions. They even curried favor with God by parading their financial muscle. The same Herod who wanted to kill all the boy babies had just completed a major remodeling of the temple in Jerusalem as if to say, Here, God, let me show you how much you need me. Let me show you how much you need my power and my wealth. It was a time in which your stature and your character were measured by the weight of your bags of gold. And yet there was no peace. There was no peace. No peace because when you spend your life doing nothing but gathering wealth, well, you spent your life. And it's all gone. And you can't bury it with you. If you do, somebody will probably dig it up. Mm-hmm. 
It's gone. It has no meaning. Jesus told that story about the man who filled his barns with grain. And when they got full, he pulled them down to big, build bigger barns. And when he faced up to what all of that meant, it was nothing but a big old coffin to hold his empty and soul-starved body. That's all it was. The attack on the World Trade Center, perhaps, was a stark reminder to us that the, the, the center of our financial muscle was really nothing. It didn't bring peace. It perhaps reminded us of how fleeting our wealth is and how it will not protect us. The times when our country is suffering was, is painful. And, and some of you, not many of you now, because they're fast fading, or perhaps you, at least your parents, you can remember a time when, when people would, uh, of that generation would almost hoard things because they remembered the Great Depression. They remember those times when you, when you had nothing and, and you had to hang on to everything. When our, when our country was going through times like that, it might have been painful, but maybe it was a good thing. Maybe it's good for us when, when the, ma the ma malls are not so crowded. Maybe it's a good thing when we haven't had a record year on Black Friday. You know that Black Friday means you're in the black. The books are not in the red, they're in the black. We've had a good year. We've, we've sold all sorts of things to people that they really didn't need. The times where our economy is suffering maybe is a good time. To so many in our world, all Christmas is is a time when they give gifts that aren't needed to people they don't like with money they don't have. So do not look for peace on earth from wealth. So the time of Jesus and also our time was a time when we depended on the government. It was a time when we depended upon our wealth. But it was also a time in the days of Jesus when people trusted in their own ingenuity to get by. We'll fix it. We're, 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 we're sharp. Our, our minds, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll do something. It was a time when people ignored faith. They paid lip service to religion. They went their own way. They made themselves into their own gods. And from the Romans who called their emperors divine, to the Greeks who worshipped their own philosophies, to the Jewish religious leaders whose religion was a nothing but an empty nothing and a vacant soul, many of the people of that day no longer paid attention to God. They no longer really believed that God was involved in this world, especially not involved personally in their lives. For them, God was a remote abstraction that you only hauled out on ceremonial occasions. But they, and I say we, in our day are no different. Sometimes when we begin to think that we don't need the presence in, of God in our daily lives, when we begin to feel that we can handle anything that life throws at us, and, and God is perhaps only for those that don't have enough sense to make their own way, then we're on the wrong track. We won't find peace. And when a catastrophe does strike... What, what is it? Is, is there something in journal? I'd like to understand. Is there something in journalism school where, where they have a class uh, to teach you to say these words? When a catastrophe happens, whether it's a mechanical failure or whether it's a terrorist attack or whether it's any tragedy, they always say, boy, we'll do something so this will never happen again. Well, I've got news for you. It probably will happen again. Now, if, if it's a mechanical thing, like, like a, a bearing on a, on a roller coaster car, you can fix that, and it probably won't happen again for a while. By the way, when I'm on this subject, if you ride those terror uh, machines anyway, roller coasters and things like that, you're out of your cotton-picking mind. My grandkids are always trying, and my kids are trying to drag me onto those things. Those death-defying, rickety things leaking oil, and it's, it's terrible. I, I mean, you know, a merry-go-round with the little horses going up and down. That's my speed, and then still I don't trust those. Those things will buck you. Yeah. You know that, Harry. They'll, they'll throw you, so don't even, don't even think about that. If it's some, that kind of catastrophe, then maybe we can fix it. But 
what about those that, that do these acts of terror, these mass shootings? Can we fix that? Not until the devil is defeated. Not until there is no evil in this world. Not until the evil one stops putting hatred and, and murder and, and thoughts into the minds of, of people who will do his bidding. There can be no peace. There can be no, it'll never happen again until Jesus comes back and takes us all to our reward. It'll always be here. I don't mean to be, and, and I am going to get on the uh, positive subject, don't worry. Just a few moments. Isn't that the way many in our world think? Oh, some of us got to, well, we go to church on Sunday, but what's that really all about? That's about doing what respectable people do, or, or that's about giving the children a good example, or that's about getting a charge out of the singers and watching the preacher hammer the sinners. But, but having a real relationship with God, letting God guide us and empower us, that's not what 21st century people are all about. They're more sophisticated than that. It's like the world in which Jesus was born. Many thought that there would be no peace. It's up to us if there is none. We'll, we'll fix it. We can handle it. And so, of course, there is no peace. There is no peace because when I am at the center of my own universe, all I have is a small package of me all wrapped up in myself. That's all I have when I'm the center of my universe. And if I search deep enough into myself, I'll find there's still no peace because there's some sort of a vacuum, a void, a God-shaped thing within me that is still empty if I choose to leave Him out. There's a restlessness down deep inside that cannot be satisfied by anything less than God Himself, than Jesus Christ His Son, than Emmanuel. There can be no peace on earth. It, there was not then and there cannot be now. Not if we trust in government to bring it or wealth to buy it or ourselves to make it happen. None of these things will bring peace. Well, what was the deal then? Why did the angels make all this hoopla? Why did they, they get this marvelous choir? Why did they appear to these angels or these uh, shepherds and say, Oh, there's going to be peace on earth. Well, they didn't listen to the whole story. They didn't listen to the, the, what they said before. Let me tell you, the angels had, had a, a good message. They said, Here, here's some good news. But they didn't hear the first part of the good news. He says, let me bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Here's the first part of the good news, not that there will be peace on earth, but that the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the promised one, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. That's the greatest news. There was good news that there will be peace on earth, but it was only a byproduct of the greatest news that God Himself, Emmanuel, God with us, has come to this earth. Listen, when you listen to the full song, the entire song of the angels, they sang of a new peace that takes away fear. And that has to include Emmanuel, God with us. The angels sang of a new peace, a new thing, and they sang it to terrified shepherds. The shepherds were terrified, no doubt, not just because of a sky filled with the rustle of angels' wings, but they were terrified of the brutal world in which they were living in. Being in the lower echelons of society, they were scared and shaken by many, many things. And when a person is beat down by life and circumstances, it's easy to be afraid. Some people don't seem satisfied until they're afraid of something. <laughs> About the time I get over being afraid of the terrorists and somebody's telling me that peanut butter is going to give me cancer. Or, or then, you know, I found out that the reason my mind is so warped because mother's milk was somehow tainted, you know. And, and, and about the time I get over that, there's something else I'm supposed to be afraid of. I'm supposed to be afraid of, you notice the, the germs on the Walmart carts when you bring them in. But we can handle that. they got those little whitey things now. I've, you you got to use those, you know, or else you'll, you'll have all sorts of diseases. But so, why do we have to be so afraid? Sometimes it's legitimate. When we saw those planes hit on September the 11th, 
or my personal one was watching a couple of bodies fall. Oh, how horrible that was. I was terrified. When we saw those buildings collapse, some people today are still afraid. They're afraid to leave their homes or, or fly in airplanes or, or open up mail. And, and many hearts are afraid in our world today. People are constantly afraid. Yet the angels sang of a new peace. A new peace. And, and the great thing about it was the peace was based upon the presence. The peace was based upon the reality of the presence. The peace was based upon God Emmanuel uh, here on this earth. This, this tiny child lying in a manger. How, how could that bring peace? But, but the angels proclaimed that it was a peace that would be wrought by one unable to wage war. One who owned nothing. One who didn't even have a place to spend his first night in the world. One who could not even take care of himself, much less manage a world in conflict. That was God Emmanuel. Peace from this child? How is that possible? But that is what the angels sang. You see, because peace does not happen because of a lack of terror, but peace comes because of the presence of God. Emmanuel. When the people of Israel were marching through the, on their journey, God would speak with Moses and he would say, I want you to do this, I want you to do that. And Moses always said, okay, if you will go with me. If you'll be with me, I'll do it. If you'll go with me. And so God gave him those, those physical signs of his presence, of the fire, the pillar of fire, and the, the clouds by day to know that he was following and he was with them. You see, if you don't pay attention to anything else this Christmas, hear me and understand, Jesus is the source of the world's peace. In Him and by Him and through Him, peace can come into our hearts. His single solitary life, cut all too short, has meant more to humanity than any other. Because His life was given to service, to love and a sacrifice. Jesus is the source of the world's peace because His life did not... Uh, uh, end at 33 years of age. It continues on today through the, the gift of His Holy Spirit. Jesus is the source of the world's peace because of His teaching, because of the example. He has swayed more hearts than all the armies that have ever marched. Of all of the senates, the congresses, the parliaments that have ever debated, in times of fear, in times of heartache, in times of terror, there can be peace if we invite Emmanuel inside and allow Him to control our lives. Jesus is the source of all peace because He offers Himself to all men, all women, wherever and whoever they are. Jesus was always available to the poor, the displaced, and the ordinary. His angels came to ordinary shepherds, rough men, not to kings and princes. His youth was shaped by peasant people in a nowhere town called Nazareth, not in the great capital city of Jerusalem. When He enlisted followers, He found them among the common and the ordinary of this life and he loved them and offered them a chance of a lifetime to help him change the world Jesus showed us that we can live without worrying <laughs> we don't have to worry about the government we don't have to worry about money that we can live without concerning ourselves with social standing that we can some be somebody's simply because God has chosen to come and live among us peace comes because we learn that in Jesus' world, everybody is somebody and nobody is ever put down. In terror, there can be no true peace. But with Jesus, there can be. Because He came to live among us. Even Henry Longfellow, in his day of war and turmoil... After he wrote that first verse, and then he thought about it and wrote those dismal, dark other verses in between. He wrote one more verse. And he put it at the end of his poem. And it was, Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, 
nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail and the right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill to men. You need peace in here where there seems to be so much turmoil. Jesus is here. Emmanuel. God is with us. He wants you to have peace because his name is Emmanuel.